Okay, we are recording. This is Ham Radio Now, episode number 387, Yuma Ham Fest, the ARRL Forum. I am David Goldenberg, W0DHG, your host, and last weekend I had the pleasure to uh, travel out to Arizona to the Yuma Ham Fest. I uh, got to lead a, meet a lot of great hams, see, uh, see a lot of great stuff. Uh, in, um, in addition to that, I got to sit in on a bunch of great forums. Well, one of the forums that I sat on in on was the ARRL forum led by uh, Dick Norton, N6AA, the Southwest Division uh, director. Uh, and he asked me to uh, record that and share it with our audience. So without further ado, here's Richard Norton. Oh yeah, and I'm sorry, it's going to be dark for a minute or two until I figure out how to turn the lights on in the room. Okay, it's exactly 3.40. Welcome to the... 2018 uh, Yuma Ham Fest and ARRL Southwestern Division Convention ARRL Forum. I'm Dick Norton, N6AA, the ARRL Southwestern Division Director. We have other um, ARRL elected uh, people in the audience. I'd like them to stand up. Um, one is the Santa Barbara Section Manager, Jim Fortney, K6IYK. Um, the uh, San Diego Section Manager, uh, Dave Coltenborn, N8KBC. Um, the Orange Section Manager, Carl Gardenius, WU6D. And um, the Los Angeles Section Manager, Diana Feinberg, AI6DF. And um, the Arizona Section Manager is uh, guarding the ARRL booth. Um, that's W7RAP Rick Paquet and John Bigley uh, and N7J uh, um, Y N7 United Radio. I'm sorry, the uh, Nevada section manager, and we also are likely to have a, a vice director is W0ND here, uh, Lynn Nelson V. Vice, Vice Director of the Dakota Division, who has escaped the uh, snow for a, a little bit and is visiting us here. Um, let's start off with a couple of awards. We have uh, people who have contributed a significant effort to the uh, cause of ham radio and the ARRL over the last few years. Um, one of them was uh, uh, awarded the Volunteer of the Year award at the ARRL Southwestern Division Convention in Torrance last October, but was unable to be there. there. And it's uh, uh, the Volunteer of the Year for the uh, 2017 uh, is awarded to Virgil Silhanic, K7VZ. Are you here, Virgil? Yes. Um, <laughs> Virgil has been uh, instrumental in um, uh, repeaters and uh, um, uh, plenty of uh, uh, activities to get to do with the uh, Arizona hams and uh, we all appreciate what he has done and he's having a family portrait uh, taken as well. Uh, uh, thanks a lot, Virgil. Yeah, thank you. Um, now, um, let's... <laughs> I've been recorded awarding an award to myself, possibly. Uh, next is um, the uh, Volunteer of the Year um, for um, uh, 2018, awarded to Dennis Beatry, KE7EJF. Uh, Dennis is the uh, Section Emergency Coordinator for Arizona. He's the uh, District Emergency Coordinator for Maricopa County. He manages the largest uh, MCOM network of repeaters in Arizona. He teaches OXCOM courses. He's uh, coordinated and published uh, uh, reports of ARIES volunteers for years. 
and uh, uh, the hams of uh, the Southwestern Division appreciate your work, Dennis. Thank you very Thank you. much. Thank you. And finally, uh, the Meritorious Service Award uh, is, uh, for 2018 is given to Thomas Bosa, NE7X. Tom is um, the uh, uh, legislative uh, coordinator. He's responsible to great measure to the uh, uh, bill that passed the Arizona uh, uh, Congress that rebates about $17 out of the $25 fee that hams pay for a call sign license plate to the amateur community, and uh, uh, the hams are uh, greatly appreciative of that. Are you here, Tom? Um, Thank you for, uh, and uh, Tom is reported to be uh, a, um, a significant force in our relations with the Arizona uh, State Legislature, and, and we all appreciate that. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Let's, uh, I want to ask one question of the group before we start. How many of you have been licensed less than five years? Eight out of uh, the entire group. Okay, thank you. Just uh, for uh, purposes of knowing what kind of group we're talking to here. Um, the forum, uh, my presentation to the forum is actually being recorded by uh, my friend David Goldenberg, who used to be my neighbor. He was actually my next door neighbor before he was licensed, and I was W6DGH, and so he got the call W0DHG and changed his name so that the initials matched. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and he, he became interested in ham radio after he moved away. I don't, don't know what that says. Uh, but anyhow, he, um, David and together with um, Gary Pierce, KN4AQ, run the ham radio uh, now.tv um, website, which has presentations on amateur radio about once a week and sometimes even more often and has a large library of things you can go to and look up and see what people have uh, discussed with uh, topics that are related to uh, issues in ham radio. Um, let's go over a couple things to do with the ARL. The ARL is in a very good financial uh, situation these days. It has 32 million dollars or so in the bank, which is about 20 million dollars more than it had, say, at the end of 2008. And this is all public information. The league publishes an annual report every year. You can all send away and get it. You can look at it on the web. It has uh, um, what the league's assets are, what the liabilities are, what, what its uh, position of making money or not uh, in the previous year. And uh, we're in excellent financial uh, situation. There have been rumors that some of the activities going on were related to the league uh, being in, in difficulty and they were tightening the ship. Nothing could be farther from the truth. We're in excellent f uh, financial shape. Membership is down a little bit. It peaked out at about 170 something thousand Oh, a couple of years ago, the dues went up from 39 a year to 49 a year. It was expected that membership would drop somewhat, and it did. We're down to like 159,000 now. So we've lost a little. Will it recover? Possibly. Uh, let's see what happens there. Uh, the largest section in the Southwestern Division is? Arizona. Arizona. What's happened, of course, is everybody retires out of California, and they move over here. <laughs> And then uh, the populations of uh, Los Angeles, Orange, Santa Barbara go down and Arizona goes up. And that's just how it is. The second largest uh, section is? Orange. Orange is correct. Orange has uh, snuck ahead of Los Angeles. And they, Los Angeles was ahead for many years. Then about five or so years ago, Orange uh, crept up and it's a little bit ahead now. So uh, uh, the... 
demographics of people in Los Angeles County has changed a lot. Uh, people have moved out to Orange. Orange is probably more amenable to ham radio because there's more space for houses to put up antennas. And uh, Los Angeles has changed the apartments that fill up parts of the city. Downtown Los Angeles, where I used to know hams, there's not any hams anymore, it's apartment houses. It's kind of just like Chicago along the lakefront or, or Manhattan. There aren't very many HF hams active in those kind of areas. So, um, and then the next uh, largest section is, is San Diego and the smallest is Santa Barbara. And remember, at one point, Santa Barbara broke off from the Los Angeles section, probably around 1950s or something like that. And actually, San Diego probably <coughs> broke away, but back in the 30s or something like that. So uh, it's, it's been quite a while. Let's talk a little bit now about the ARL board, what happened at the board meeting in uh, January a couple of weeks ago. And the first topic I'm going to cover is political parties. Now, when it comes to national politics or state politics, for the most part, politicians are a member of a party, and you get some idea of what their philosophy is by the fact that they're a Democrat or a Republican or whatever else they might be. The League has evolved or devolved, depending upon uh, your personal philosophy into having a couple of parties now and I'll kind of describe them and they don't have names and it's not official but if you look at who the people are and how they're voting you can probably attribute uh, uh, party names to them and I'm going to call them uh, the confidentiality party and the transparency party and um, the confidentiality party um, I would say is characterized by a number of things. Everyone isn't the same, just like all Republicans don't believe absolutely the same thing, nor do all Democrats. But they believe uh, confidentiality of discussions is very important. And they also are responsible for the uh, imposition or, or uh, development of the quote, code of conduct, which we'll be covering a little longer. Um, they have been involved in censuring uh, directors or they have been involved in disqualifying people who have been directors from running again or something to that effect. Um, they are opposed to directors conducting what they call investigations. They don't like directors to um, look at how much money is being spent on something and why and report back to the board. And um, they're in some sense uh, been it, it looks like they are sort of trying to consolidate power to themselves and uh, by m activities of members of the board as opposed to uh, votes of the membership. The transparency people, I'll say, um, they kind of act as if their primary responsibility is to the membership or to amateur radio. Uh, they're primarily um, pursuing having members elect directors. They're uh, primarily uh, interested in having freedom of discussion without any reservations. Uh, they're allow, they like all sides to be heard on issues. If something comes up and somebody gets accused of something, uh, some of us feel that there's two sides to almost every story. And whoever gets accused ought to be given an opportunity to at least present his side. There have been a number of cases recently where this has not happened. And they're also, I'll say, oriented toward fiscal restraint. Um, right now, the confidentiality party has a majority, and it's something of the order of 10 to 5. So you might think that's... Uh, means something in particular that confidentiality is more important. That would not be the case 10 years ago and probably wouldn't be the case five years ago, but it just happens that in this particular division, this guy retired or became <coughs> an officer or died, and the, the person who replaced him has a totally different philosophy. And I assume that they're uh, acting in 
what they believe is the best interests of the league or uh, ham radio or something to that effect. And uh, so that's where they are. So again, um, we're, and what's also happened is basically the, the president, of course, is a member of the, uh, I'll call the ruling party, and the appointments he makes are putting people of his own party in all positions of power in the league. Uh, the most, a very powerful group is called the Elections and Ethics Committee. Excuse me, I'm going to uh, have a drink here. <coughs> And they are the group that has disqualified people for running for election. And all three of them are basically from that group the last year, similarly the year before, similarly. So um, that's quite powerful. The chairmen of the um, Administration and Finance Committee and the P Programs and Services Committee also fill that uh, bill. The League also, the directors are sort of divided into three committees. The first committee is elected, five members of the board are elected to what's called the executive committee. Um, they are elected and they, their position is to, uh, their function is to serve uh, in the running of the league between board meetings. All five of those directors are essentially uh, members of what I'll call the confidentiality party. So that's uh, the way things are uh, today. Another interesting thing is when you people vote for directors, as a rule, nobody knows or asks questions that relate to that, uh, what I'll call your party affiliation. You, we generally run on our background of being section manager or uh, a lawyer interested in radio, or in my case, I did a lot of work with con the contest community. And that's how we got known somehow, but no one really knows what our philosophy is. And in government politics, it's important to know whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. You convey a lot of information to the, your constituency about how you might be voting on issues. So um, with that, let's start out with a, another interesting thing. What's the first thing that happens at an ARRL board meeting? they vote for the president and the vice presidents. So a guy that gets elected to the board, he comes in, sits down, and the first thing he does is get to vote for who's president. I always thought that was unusual in that I thought we should have the reports from all the officers <coughs> for the uh, previous six months, the reports from all the committees, so that people on the board, particularly those that are new, see what's happening and base their decisions on that. Uh, as far as who's going to vote. Uh, for what? So, um, and let's start out here. Um, the first thing that happened at the meeting actually happened in the day before the board meeting was in the administration and finance committee meeting that I'm a member of. And it was announced to us there that the present uh, CEO Tom Gallagher, NY2RF, was resigning. And that was somewhat of a surprise to me. I'd never heard anything about it until I sat in the room and they uh, uh, went into some committee of the whole where you're not supposed to announce what happened, but they announced what happened about a half an hour later to the public. And of course, uh, it's in the magazines and all over now, so there's no issue about talking about it. Um, Tom Gallagher lasted about two years. He was a person who had a significant business experience. He was a financial executive, quite successful. Uh, there was something uh, that was in his background that I thought was unusual. He didn't actually apply for the job. People found out about him and then recruited him. And I was very impressed with him. He interviews well, he's smart, he, uh, he, he impressed me and he impressed everybody. We were uh, very uh, uh, taken with him. And I would say, in the end, he treated the league more like a business than, I'll say, an association of radio hams, which I kind of uh, thought it is. And 
and made f decisions that seemed to be appropriate for, for a business making money. And if you, you know, make money in a, in a business, the stock goes up or something like that. But that isn't necessarily what we do uh, in the ARRL. And one of the things that struck me and some of you was, uh, do people remember the editorial in QST that said, myth busting, ARRL, not a big radio club? And what this was prompted by an editorial in CQ magazine that was criticizing some things like the code of conduct, and it said, why are we needing all this secrecy? After all, the league is basically a big radio club. And so Tom wrote an editorial saying, no, it's not. Uh, what it is is a Connecticut 501c3 corporation, and it's a career. Well, yeah, it's a career for about 90 employees in, of the league in Newington, Connecticut. It is a 501c3 Connecticut corporation, but I don't know how many of you <coughs> would really care whether it's a Connecticut corporation or a Bahamas corporation. Um, my suspicion is most people are members of the league because it's a big radio club. Um, so I kind of thought that was an unusual uh, uh, response. And um, in the end, he's, he did some good, uh, but uh, some, the, the staff has changed to the point where I'm a little bit worried. We lost several people who I considered to be the league's future. A significant group of uh, impo important employees at the league are around 65 years old or a little older, and most of you realize that's an age where most of us retire. So we had a group around 50 that I thought was going to move in, and they're sort of gone now, so uh, we have to replace them some way, I suspect. Um, so let's see what happens. What, uh, in the meantime, the chief financial officer, Barry Shelley, N1VXY, uh, has been named interim CEO. Barry is a good guy. I've supported him over the years. He's very responsive to whatever I've asked him to do. Um, I'll do whatever I can in, uh, uh, in my uh, ability to make his uh, uh, service as CEO as successful and profitable uh, for, for the membership uh, operation. So let's see what that happens uh, to, to give us. Let's move on. Um, Okay, there have been, there's an or organization called myarlvoice.org. Does anyone know about it? Um, a little around half of you. Well, there were a, a number of proposed amendments to the ARRL, uh, so Articles of Association and Bylaws that were, um, oh, I've just been donated a uh, throat lozenge. That may may improve this presentation. I will pause while I consume it. Um, excuse me. So um, there were a group of I'll say fourteen proposed amendments to the bylaws put together by the executive committee and a group of four of them that were put together by the Hudson Division Director. Those put together by the Hudson Division Director basically allowed the officers of the league, which would be the president and three vice presidents, to have votes on the board just like they were directors. Well, the league, uh, by articles of association, basically say that you cannot be an officer and a director at the same time. So everyone who became an officer understood that when they became a vice president, they didn't have a vote anymore. So they shouldn't be surprised at that, uh, that happening. And overall, members complained about that significantly. Uh, I kind of got the idea that had that been, had those four motions been introduced, they might have lost 14 to one. So in the end, they were never introduced. And uh, they were made public. Uh, N2YBB, the Hudson director, said it was perfectly acceptable to uh, publicize those to the membership and see what the members thought. 
The second group of 11 or so, or 11 to 14 proposals was put together by the executive committee and had what some hams thought were fairly harsh um, terms. They allowed the league to expel members. They allowed the board to vote members off the board and uh, similar <coughs> things like that. Um, those were not a, a, appeared, did not appear to be generally appreciated by the members as well. In fact, during the board meeting, um, there, there, this my ARL voice organization kind of spearheaded uh, letters and emails to the board members uh, giving their opinion on these particular issues. One board member at the meeting said, I had received uh, 783 emails from members on these issues. I asked him, well, how many of these were uh, positive to the ARL position? His answer was exactly zero. Another director pointed out he had received over a thousand emails and um, he was the Atlantic Division director and there's been a lot of activity in eastern Pennsylvania that has the members somewhat upset and so uh, there was a lot of he, he received more emails than I believe the rest of us. I didn't receive 783 emails. I received less than that, but I received many hundreds, and the uh, uh, gist of them all was the same. The members did not appreciate any of these proposed uh, changes to the league's operation. <coughs> so, in the end, by the members voicing their uh, opinions, nothing, nothing, none of these ominous uh, potential uh, changes were ever made. And I would say at this point, it's likely that uh, some of them might get brought up in the future. The, the uh, uh, battle isn't 100% over if you're in favor of not having the changes. Uh, there's a me board meeting coming up in July and if nobody makes any noise, who knows, the same people may introduce the same motions and they might pass, I can't tell you. So I suspect that there, those involved with them are uh, uh, going to, again, have members and, and themselves sending emails and letters and whatever around and let's see what happens with respect uh, to that in July. Um, another interesting point about the uh, minutes is the minutes of this last meeting were approved by eight directors. There are 15 directors and when eight approved it, they published the minutes and said the minutes are approved. So <clears throat> that might tell you something. Um, I didn't happen to approve them. I, I hadn't voted, but I had, uh, I did not approve the minutes of the Ju July board meeting last year, and the reason is this. According to Robert's Rules of Order, which the League follows, so you can't complain that they're breaking the rules, if you introduce a motion, and then based on the discussion, the guy withdraws the motion, there's no mention of it. So um, my thought, and the thought of some of the other uh, board members was, we spent a lot of energy talking about this stuff. We should at least tell the members the motion was introduced. We talked about it and it was withdrawn. But that doesn't apparently uh, fit Robert's rules of order. There were two of the motions that were mentioned in the minutes and that was because one of them was referred to the administration and finance committee and the other was referred to the staff. So they weren't just withdrawn, something uh, definitely happened so that they're indeed um, mentioned there. I'm not the only one to tell you this. Another director has put out an email to his division within the week after the board meeting announcing that they, the things were withdrawn. So I'm uh, just following in his footsteps or, or repeating what he has told his uh, membership, which you can obviously see is the case. And particularly if you were involved with the ARRL a voice group, they were all concerned about this. They can look in the minutes and see nothing happened, so nothing did happen with respect to those uh, particular issues. Um, 
we had <clears throat> election of officers, the, the past president, K5UR, uh, Rick Rodrick was re-elected, Tom Frenet, K1KI, uh, ran against him and uh, the vote was nine to six, so um, Rodrick is again president for the next two years. There was uh, one change, the second vice president was Brian Milosowski, N5ZGT from Albuquerque. His career and family uh, have taken a change. He was promoted at work to the point where he really didn't have time to do the league and, and maintain his family. And so he gave up something and I asked, I suggested to him, I hope you're available in 20 years when you retire to come back and he said he would. I hope that's the case. So uh, he's gone. The election was between Bob Valley, OW6RGG, the Pacific Division Director, and Jim Pace, K7CEX, the Northwestern Division uh, Director. Bob Valigo uh, was the victor, and he is second vice president. When he became second vice president, the vice director of the Pacific Division, Jim Teamster, K6JAT, was elevated to director. Jim is a, an attorney. He thinks well. I'm uh, uh, very impressed with him. He's retiring fully in June. He has time to dedicate to this. He has uh, shown his ability to express his thoughts in a very um, forceful way and, and analyze things in his communication with the board, and I'm uh, pleased to see that he's in that position. He appointed uh, Kristen McIntyre, K6WX, uh, who ha has been a speaker here at Yuma, I think, a, a year ago. Uh, Christine is a, an engineer at Apple. I know her as a technical person. I hope she survives the uh, fierce political battles of the uh, ARRL board, and I wish her luck, and I suspect, given uh, I, I'm impressed with her technically, I think she'll do just fine. I was sort of hoping she'd be here, but I don't see her, so that's the... Uh, uh, thing. Let's see. Let's talk about a search for the new CEO. <clears throat> My view was we had, we just selected a CEO two years ago, Tom Gallagher. We had a bunch of resumes of people that were almost <coughs> selected. My thought was, why don't we just take the top group of those, ask them if they're still interested, interview them, and make a selection out of that uh, group. And that wasn't the way they went. They uh, are forming a new CEO search committee. They're putting together a list of all the attributes the CEO should have. They're going to hire another search firm uh, to beat the bushes. And again, uh, my thought was if the person who becomes CEO isn't interested enough to apply on his own, didn't hear about the job by reading QST, by reading the ARRL newsletters that come out every week on the internet or on the web or talking to uh, people or uh, n being known to one of the directors or somebody who gets him referred. I don't know whether that's the right kind of person. He, it's, uh, my thought is the guy should have uh, the uh, amateur radio and or the ARRL more in his heart than than to be recruited and say, yes, you're a good businessman, and oh, you do have a ham radio license, uh, let's see what you can do. Our issues are not necessarily financial. We have a lot of money. Um, our issues are keeping members happy and uh, uh, doing what's right for amateur radio and uh, how it relates to the rest of the public. Thank you. Um, Talked about that. Let's talk about um, HR 555, the Homeowners Association uh, legislation that's in uh, Congress these days. How many of you live in HOA areas? Oh, about ten or uh, so out of the group. Well, H HR 555 is an interesting uh, bit of proposed legislation. There are pluses and minuses. And let's talk about the pluses first. The pluses are that if it becomes law, the FCC would issue some ruling that said, 
HOAs would have to allow an effective antenna. They couldn't ban one. And um, what does that, what is an effective antenna? Um, the problem is that for 440, an effective antenna is a vertical about the size of this pen. So um, it appears that possibly by allowing a four inch vertical, an HOA would satisfy this uh, proposed legislation. Number two is the HOA would have right of refusal of any antenna based on aesthetic con considerations. What does that mean? We don't like how it looks. We disapprove it. End of the story. There isn't any, we're sorry your, your uh, views of aesthetics are different than, than mine. No, it's, they make the ruling, so that's considered not necessarily a positive. Other things that were brought out are, um, the ham would have to get prior permission from the HOA to put the antenna up. Now, that differs from what we call the OTARD rule. Back 30 years ago or so, um, there was difficulty with HOAs outlawing TV antennas, in particular satellite dishes. The satellite TV industry lobbied the government to get the FCC to allow them. The number of people who watch TV is actually larger than the number of radio hams. Um, and so they were quite successful in, in getting that through. And th the way that rule is written is, you can put up up to a one meter dish in any part of your property that you own by yourself without permission. And if the homeowners association wants to do anything, they have to take action to make you take it down. Now, in this case, the ham would have to apply to the HOA before he puts the antenna up. And what is the uh, uh, amount of time the HOA has to make the decision? Infinite. Well, we've only been we've only been considering your inf your application for ten years. We need another couple. Uh, just calm down, and we will get around to it. Maybe. So, that is pointed out as a possible uh, negative. Number three, as people have pointed out, that if you have an antenna that no one knows about, such as an indoor dipole and your contract with your HOA says no antennas, period, right now you're breaking your contract with the HOA, but if this passed, it appears you might be breaking federal law. Now, other people are gonna say, well, no, the FCC or the government isn't gonna bother you, but is it really a good thing? I don't know. So, and the, the last thing that I've heard a negative about it potentially is, there are homeowners associations that have absolutely nothing to do with antennas. There are people who live on 100 acre parcels that have a homeowners association that maintains roads or picks up garbage. And the way the, the legislation is written now, one would have to get permission from them to put up an antenna. Well, uh, you go to your homeowners association and you apply for permission and they look at it as what has this got to do with picking up garbage? So I don't know what happens there. There are other people who say, don't worry about that. It obviously wouldn't apply there. I don't know whether it does or not. So we have uh, lawyers who have, uh, a lawyer, Jim Talens, N3JT, who used to work for the FCC, wrote a, an article in CQ Magazine basically stating these things. And uh, Fred Hope and Garten, K1VR, who's a, uh, recognized authority on antenna zoning. He wrote the ARRL antenna zoning in the radio amateur book. Um, he feels that way. And there are uh, a, a group of people who, again, feel that the possibility of allowing an antenna would uh, overcome that. There's one thing that definitely would be an advantage should this pass. Right now, a lot of people who live in HOA areas have negotiated settlements with their HOAs to put some kind of antenna up. Is anyone here in that position? Yes, some of you have done that. I know uh, a number that have. 
There are a few cases where you'll negotiate with your HOA, they'll give you permission, and then somebody in your neighborhood doesn't like you, and they read in the rules, no antennas, period, and they'll say the HOA doesn't have the right to give you permission. Should this legislation ever pass, uh, that wouldn't be uh, valid anymore. Uh, they, could, they could grant you permission. So I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, this is, we've been, the League has been pushing this for quite a few years. Uh, originally, we, the, the program was to have some kind of legislation that applied the same rules as PRB1 applies to the governments. And the, there's a FCC ruling that governments have to uh, provide for, for amateur radio. And the initial objective of, of this uh, legislation was to do exactly the same thing for homeowners associations. The bill proceeded to a point where it was not going anywhere in Congress and the League negotiated with the Association of Homeowners Associations, which is called CAI, Community Associations International, and it's deemed that uh, the negotiation gave a little too much power to the associations, and that's something that you guys have to uh, make a decision about your, uh, yourselves and decide what you think is correct. The League is still pursuing this. Will it pass? Do I know if it passes, will uh, President Trump sign it? Any of you deal with him regularly, you want to ask him? Um, he's never indicated anything to me that uh, one way or the other, but he remember, he is a real estate developer and uh, a landlord, so I don't know how he uh, uh, react to this kind of thing. Any comments or uh, uh, suggestions or questions regarding HR 555? Nobody, okay. Let's talk about something else. Um, <clears throat> on Thursday night of the board meeting, we were uh, given a presentation by a local uh, Hartford area public relations firm who was given the task of uh, dealing with new hams. And basically about every year in the United States, 30,000 people get new ham licenses about 3,000 of them join the ARRL, and after a year, about 600 of them continue uh, on to the second year, and we don't have, like, how about after five years, how many are left, I don't know. The question was, well, what do we do to make more people join the league and allow more people to stay in, uh, get them interested? It's a tough question, and it's been asked for many, many years. The, and the solution that, that the people uh, who gave the presentation was, well, a lot of people said what they needed was mentors. Mentors would help them uh, maintain interest in amateur radio. And their proposal was, well, we have mentors. They won't be humans, but it'll be a website. Um, so we'll have a website and there'll be, when you log in, you'll either go to one of two places. If you were licensed less than a year, you'll go to the newbie license uh, web part, and then if you're licensed for more than that, you'll go to some other site, and that will uh, be the start of a lifelong learning process. They wanted over $400,000 to do their part of the uh, um, website, which would be called a lifelong learning uh, website, and um, an interesting feature of it was there would be no content. It was up to the ARRL to supply the content. So uh, some of the people on the board had familiarity with software development programs in the past. Some of them have uh, come up with the idea that most software programs cost two to three times the initial estimate before they're finished. And here we have one that if that happened, we'd still have no content. We have to develop the content somewhere and put it in. So um, I wasn't particularly uh, enthralled with this. There are plenty of people other than the ARRL who have websites with things on it that you can learn how to solder PL259s, how to build dipoles, how to build uh, tape measure antennas. There's all kinds of that out there and my thought was we need to collect some of that, maybe put it on a website now and see what we can do without having somebody uh, start from scratch and redevelop 
the, uh, the world from zero. I found out since I got, came back and I talked to my predecessor in this job, Art Goddard, W6XD, he was big into mentoring as well. And one of the last uh, things he did in his term was to get a, a mentoring program started at the league where they had a publication called something of the order of the coach's handbook and the coach was supposed to be the guy that was going to mentor all the people. And how many of you are uh, actively involved in that? Uh, we do have somebody. Do you have the coach's handbook and all? So we do have one person uh, that, that knows about it and is using it. And, but it seems to have faded into the woodwork. I didn't even know it existed, which says something. So yes, mentoring is important. <coughs> I kind of view it as you get lucky and in some club or something you'll have some guy who's a star. He knows how to do this. The people like him. It just fits together and that club thrives because of an individual or several individuals. I don't know how to replicate them. Other, <coughs> other clubs may not have anything to, like that. Dick? Yes, sir. Why doesn't the league just compile a list of volunteers who are willing to mentor and have it listed on the, uh, the website, uh, perhaps by sections. Um, everyone heard that, why, don't, why doesn't the league just uh, put out a call and have people who uh, are interested in being mentored in a list and put it out by section? That's an excellent suggestion. Thank you, that's part of the reason I come here is to have the people in the audience suggest things that I should do. Okay, that's another suggestion um, that the hints and kinks, we should have hints with similar uh, suggestions as well. That's decent. We already have a program that's a podcast, The Doctor is In, that is at a relatively low level for the newer hams, uh, and it's on, uh, I believe it's every other Thursday, there's a new one that comes up, and the prior uh, editions of it are on the website. Okay, it was pointed out that we have the uh, Doctors is In podcasts available on the AR website. They are at a fairly low level and they do teach people. They are quite uh, successful and people do appreciate them. So that has indeed worked. Um, Don't they have Elmers anymore? Well, there are Elmers, but yes. where do you necessarily get Elmers? Every radio club should have them. Every, every radio club doesn't. Some do, but if you read descriptions, some people will go to a club meeting, they'll sit in the back of the room, no one talks to them, they go home and that's the end of it. Um, a club that is, is thriving and growing will probably uh, go around and find those people. Actually, the Arizona section manager, Rick Paquette, uh, when he goes to a club, he walks around and tries to talk to people in the beginning and then asks uh, who has been licensed less than a year. And then he'll stand up and uh, when they introduce him, he'll say, who are the most important people in this room? And everybody's supposed to go, well, the president and the vice president. And he says, no, the guys who have been licensed less than a year, they're your future. They're who you should be concentrating on. So um, again, I, I kind of concur to a reasonable extent uh, with that idea. So, a lot of people think one of the big benefits that is UFD Magazine. Is the ARL ever going to make it work on mobile devices? Because it pretty much fails as a software solution. So the digital version is useless, and if you're trying to appeal to the younger crowd, and they can't put it on their Kindle or anything that works, why would they pay for an organization when they can't even get the magazine? Well, um, did everyone hear that? We had a comment that uh, QST is um, less than valuable uh, for uh, some newcomers, particularly youngsters. Now, there are a lot of people who consider QST to be the main reason they're members of the ARRL. In fact, there are people who say, I, would just, I want to renew my QST subscription, and I try to say, well, that isn't all you're doing, but uh, sometimes I'm successful. 
However, um, I can't tell you that nobody uh, likes it. There, is a, there are digital versions of QST, and they do work on certain devices. I can't tell you which ones they work on well and which ones they don't work on. But we changed our digital provider company from one where they weren't working on many to another that is supposedly uh, capable of making it work on more things. Now, I don't know what, how much work they have to do to go from Android to um, Mac, uh, Mac or whatever. Um, How many uh, uh, agree with what we just heard, that the, uh, that the website works worse now than it did before? Uh, I'm sorry, the uh, digital version of QST is working worse than it did before. There's actually quite a few of you, so I thank you for doing that. Um, I was actually not aware of the extent of what's gone on, and I'm going to report that at the ANF meeting in uh, April. Um, and there were 25 of you that said that, so that's like a significant uh, group. Kathy? I just looked up on my iPhone for QST education. One star, 63 people. <laughs> <laughs> one star. One, okay, QST gets a iPhone rating of one star. Um, <laughs> It's interesting, and people have proposed essentially that, which if anyone didn't hear it, the uh, suggestion was made that in the Association of uh, Civil Engineers, when people become licensed, they are given a free one-year membership, and then they are given a reduced rate membership for the next couple years uh, in an attempt to get them involved and um, active. It's, I, I think, a little different because if civil engineering, you've made a commitment because you've gone to school, you've gotten a degree in civil engineering or something similar that allows you to practice, and you've, you're aimed at, at that, the amount of effort it takes to get a ham radio license these days isn't necessarily anywhere near that. Mo most people can go to a two or three hour cram course at, with a 98% pass rate and get a license. And I think a lot of those, once they get it, they don't become interested. A lot of people who are becoming interested in ham radio now are becoming interested for emergency communications. And I liken it to uh, my little town of Topanga where I live. And we have earthquakes, we have fires, we have floods every hundred years. And um, the discussion goes something like, well, you know what happens when we have an earthquake or fire? Oh, what happens? The cell phones don't work. The cell phones don't work? What do you do? You get a ham radio. A ham radio, what's that? Well, it looks like a cell phone, but you have to go to a class for two hours on Saturday and get a license for it. And a number of them do. And we must have close to 100 people in Topanga with licenses. About half a dozen to 10 of them have become what you'll call hams. They're interested enough to do other things in ham radio. A lot of them never buy radios at all. They just kind of... Um, got involved and got licenses. So I don't know how to make them interested in ham radio. Um, to me, the ARRL is an organization of on-the-air hams. If you're not really interested in that, 
I don't know how we can do that. I mean, I liken it to bowling. I used to go bowling. Bowling's an okay thing. There's nothing wrong with it. I liked it. I don't go anymore, and I don't know how you could talk me into it. I do something else, and these people do something else too. So how do we make ham radio zingy enough to attract their attention? It's a tough uh, sell. Yeah, I mean, I, I would certainly be in favor of some kind of reduced first year membership, but, you know, at least 10 or $20 to at least have some indication that they have a, a, a minor interest in it. Um, that will likely get proposed. Sorry, did you want to circle back to the QST app? I Go. Have a number of iOS devices, and I have not had a single problem with the app, no problems. Even on the laptop, it works wonderfully. Um, okay, We're, I'm, it's requested that I take a, a second poll. First, we had a poll of people who had complaints about reading QST on their iPhones. How many read QST on their iPhones and don't have any complaints? Um, it might depend on the speed of your internet connection. Well, that's, that's inherent with anything. So. Well, no, no. That's a load of crap. No. I heard this. Their big concern is QST might get out in the open and people would read it for free. OMG. I'd like to go boondock in an RV for a month and take QST with me on my Android device, and I can't do that. Yes, you can. And there's no excuse for that. Yes, you can. Other than, no, you can't. I corresponded with tech support, and they say, no, you can't do that on your Android device. Why the hell not? Sounds like an Android problem. Um, can you do it on a I can do it with other magazines. I can't do it with QSD. Where's the problem? I can do it with CQ. It's not a problem. That's right. Are you so. using Wi-Fi while you're doing it? No! Okay, so um, what I'm kind of uh, hearing overall is there are issues with some devices, particularly in terms of downloading QST and reading it at your leisure. And um, yes. we should probably be solving those. Yes. It's not um, hard to solve. It's a question of uh, other, other organizations have solved them and you're succeeding and it's working. That's right. Okay, I, I hear your message, and I am going to bring this up at the next uh, uh, meeting, and let's see whether we can get anywhere. I'll let Dwayne do it. You'll let? I'll let Dwayne do Dwayne? Dwayne. Oh, Dwayne Allen, okay, sure. Um, all right, uh, any more comments on that issues? Anyone who is an ARRL member is automatically will get a hard copy unless you don't want it. There are people who don't want it. I just uh, talked with one of them two hours ago. He's, I don't want it. I live in a motor home. I'm never anywhere. All it does is congest my life. I want it uh, on the web. Can I do that? And I said, yes, uh, we uh, signed up and I made a note on his application. No magazine, only on the web because the oddly enough the, the application form said if you're foreign you can get a foreign subscription with no magazine and it and he wondered why there wasn't that option in uh for american uh, 
uh, members, and I pointed out that you could absolutely go to the website and change it, but Will hopefully got it changed on the application, so that's why. Everyone is entitled to it. There's no savings of money uh, or anything that, uh, and that's a league decision is we have decided that everyone should get the magazine and you don't get a discount when we don't have to mail the magazine to you because the magazine in some extent is paid for by advertisers and when you read it on the web they advertisers don't feel they're getting the value for their advertising dollar that they do when you're uh, looking at a hard copy and they seemingly uh, uh, get more value out of that so that's where, where that comes from more comments giving 30,000 new members a magazine subscription for their membership for the one year would cost essentially nothing, and they'd get 12 invitations to get active. Okay, it, it isn't nothing, it's uh, the... It the, would be very little, it would never be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Well, it would be, my estimate is 30,000, uh, if they got a... a an electronic magazine, what you say is true. If they got a hard copy magazine, we're talking three to five hundred thousand dollars, three hundred to five hundred. So that's significant because it's at least a dollar to uh, publish and mail a magazine to a member. That's only thirty thousand. But there's thirty thousand um, hams that get licenses. Uh, every year, thirty thousand people are licensed. If we were to give every one of those 30,000 people a one-year subscription, one-year uh, ARRL membership, which includes a subscription to QST, we would be paying at least $12 for each one of those 30,000, which is $360,000 minimum. So it would cost us something. Then it would also cost us uh, overhead to manage their subscriptions and their, uh, have the, the people that take care of whether they are expiring and whether we send out uh, notices whether they'll renew or not. So it, it is a significant expenditure. And I'm, I, I don't know that it would, would work because if they're not interested enough to join the first year, I, I would compromise with you and again say, give them a $20 uh, membership for the first year, which probably covers most of the cost and, and let's see what happens there. Yes, Jim. Not a compromise. You'll excuse me, but I personally believe the gentleman has an outstanding idea. The problem we have with the new people is we need to immerse them in the hobby. And if you are expecting them to go get involved enough to know that there's even a league to join, you're asking an awful lot of this people. We can obviously improve our BE sessions to make sure we get more handouts to make them aware, but it sounds to me like we would like, at least some of us would like for a cost analysis to be done on this, because I believe that there's an opportunity here for a reduction in uh, membership initiation costs, well under that idea of, and I realized the web thing was passed off because it was too expensive. But I think there's an opportunity here for us to immerse people in the hobby by pushing it on them, by shoving them a magazine for a year that would be very valuable. So I, I think we really ought to look, not just shut it down, we need to look further at this. Okay. Um, I guess I'd like you to take one of your polls. Let, let, let's say, uh, let me have Earl wants to comment on that first. Well, I was going to say, it would be more useful, I would think, for, for the them to get a free membership into a club for a year and to then start sending them the club newsletter. So I don't know if there's a process for, between the FCC and the clubs to say announce who in, the, who in your district has received a license this year. You know, so we could start doing okay. that and inviting them to everything, you know. You know, we have clubs that do that now. We, our, our active clubs do that sort of thing now. Exactly. But I'll, my estimate in my section is that we probably touch 10% of 
of the new amps. Yeah, clubs, clubs have access to like a new AM report yeah. where they can they can query lists. But whether they do it or not is something else. Yeah. How effective they are at doing it is something else. Okay, um, let me. But is there a process between the FCC? Okay, the FCC uh, um, issues a. Uh, let me try to explain it as best I know. All the license data that comes out of the FCC is public. You can look up my license, I can look up your license or anyone else. The ARL used to get all the uh, new licensees, and I believe they still do, because I believe they send them solicitations to join the league. Now, um, instead of just sending them a solicitation, the suggestion is essentially, hey, we're going to give you a, a free year membership or six month membership or something like that uh, to the ARRL. Some clubs have, uh, have somehow or other gotten this information from the league. There are people in clubs who have, or even section managers who have complained that the league no longer does this in a way that they feel that they're able to respond to this kind of suggestion and and service new members as well as they would like. So that's indeed an issue that, that the uh, league should be addressing. As to whether we should give the uh, new members uh, a year's membership in the league, let me ask the group um, uh, to vote. I is that a good idea? All those who believe that the league should spend whatever it costs to give all new hams a one-year membership um, and mail the magazine, or then I'm going to also say, uh, I have a second one uh, question that is, how about that they get a one-year membership with only an electronic magazine? Uh, John? Website's going to have yeah, it happen. Yeah. 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 All right, let's, let's go one, two, and then three. First, and with this, if you only doubled your retention rate, which is still not a huge number, it would be a lot. It, it would be, but the issue is remember, those who paid money for the magazine, <coughs> there were 3,000 of them. Only 600 are continuing. So, why, if they didn't pay money, would they decide to pay money the next year? Uh, just a second, John. We had somebody way in the back. I was going to suggest that one of the concerns that new hands would have if they didn't get their license through a club, because there's a caveat there as well, is the ARL has a list of all clubs by address relative to that person's location. I can go on and I can figure out what my neighbor who I am. Right? Not just give them possibly some kind of membership to the ARL, but also tell them with that membership. You are the club in your area that you can go join because unless you know where to look on the web, you're not going to find a ham radio club in your neighborhood. No, I agree. That would be an, an excellent um, thing the league could do. Do we have more comments before I ask this poll? Question. 30 more of those extra people they get. Your advertisers are getting to those extra people. Yep. They may get people that may help with them to sell their product. Amen. Okay, that's uh, indeed a consideration. Any more? Uh, John. Just two quick comments. We used to proactively from the AWRO get the uh, database from the FCC, whatever a license was issued, the AWRO would send out a mail, multiple mailers. I know mailing costs money. Um, and the other thing is when you ask the poll about the electronic version of the uh, magazine, <coughs> I just had the Android app on my Android phone. I just downloaded the March 2018 edition of the, the antenna special. 
and, and I can go back to January of 2012 and I and download all the magazines back to 2012, January 2012. And can you take that and, and disconnect from the internet and still read it? I just did it right here. And I can read it, read it page by page. I, it, it doesn't show all the things, but you have to select each page. So you have the airplane mode? I don't know. I push a button here and I'll read it that way. Well, well, right. Well, you're connected to the wireless. Yeah. Correct. I, I yeah, just downloaded it. But if you turn, if the wireless went out, would would that stay on your on your cell phone? Yes. And so that's um, we have somebody saying no and somebody saying yes. All right, that's, that's quite interesting. And um, another thing I kind of come out of this is there, it wouldn't be a bad idea if at a convention like this there was somebody who was an expert in this who gave a talk on all this and afterwards had the ability to have people come up to him and, and discuss their individual issues and maybe straighten things out. I, I, right now, um, I have people who both uh, sound like, uh, you know, I should believe them, and they're sort of saying the opposite thing. So it is indeed, you know, some combination of your individual device, whatever uh, program you're using, whatever program the league is using, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and that really shouldn't be, and we should work uh, some way to uh, ameliorate that. Let's, um, here. Just a quick point on that. Uh Okay, so there are uh, downloading issues. Um, I've received that message. Let me ask again, uh, David. Okay. To engagement. Engagement. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's the the, the giving them a free magazine or getting to show up to meeting. It's about engagement. Yes. Well, we need to be as more engaging, right? Because right. not all the clubs have a newsletter or have a have a greeter. Really, that's what we do at our club. Is we have a greeter. Somebody is assigned to say. Wow, we've never seen you before. Welcome, and, and, and you have to find that right person. That that's the key. Like sending a message. Not everybody's within reach of the club. And, and that's true too. But we have to figure out how to do that. <coughs> it's the engagement. Um, I'm a new man. I've had my license less than five months, um, and I think. <laughs> Did you join the league? Yes, because the, the minute I got my license, I, I Googled what should I do now that I have my license, and there's a guy out there, I don't know if it's this guy or not, but it says 21 things you should do now that you've got your license, and number two was join the ARL. So. All right, that's uh, interesting. Kathy? Have a list of all the clubs in your generalized areas. 
Well, Joy Matlock used to produce. Joy Matlock used to produce these big sheets uh, about ten years ago that uh, we we would give out. Just a second, we have someone back here first. What does the league send to New Hampshire? I'm not certain, but I believe they send a solicitation for membership. Yeah, and several of them over several months. I joined like a week later. You got one a week later. No, no, I joined. Oh, you joined immediately, so you didn't get the solicitation. I would just like to reinforce, as a relatively new hand, what was important to me was not so much the clubs, because I didn't know what that meant in terms of a commitment, but what hooked me was a get on the air that you could go to with no obligation, seemingly just no strings attached, and actually talk, you know, talk with somebody who you the radio, walk you through the mystery of the radio, get you over the mic, you know, shyness and just get on the air and then learn about the clubs after that but just personal experience just a no strings attached get on the air soon after you get uh, your license was key Dick, okay our club teaches classes and what we do is about a month afterwards we have what's called a skills day we gather in a local park you have an hd bring it uh, we have radio set up we try to get people on the air, whether they have a radio or not, and, and <coughs> try to get their feet wet that way. Okay, the uh, suggestion was a skills day. We had a few more people, uh, John. Okay, what we do in Las Vegas and also in Reno is we have a full, like, magazine racks that we need to bring out to have all the literature for ARRL and the various clubs and, and it, for example, the Las Vegas Radio Amateur Club in Dallas, they have the certificate right there. Here's your free membership. So when you pass your exam, you're getting your free membership if you so desire to, to, to take it. They have the repeater list and all the tangible things that you need to get started. I like the 21 things you should do. I just look at that. And maybe if, if there's a video out there, maybe while you're, I know how everybody runs their PE sessions, but while you're waiting to see if you pass your exam out there, maybe that video will be running on. Seventy-nine dollar thirty-two dollar MCB out there where they can get the twenty-one things and, 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 and a good place in engaging there. Kid, you know, years ago CQ ran a whole series for not novices. I've never seen QST do that. In fact, a newbie that picks up the QST, he can't understand anything in there except that it's damn expensive. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's interesting. As a rule, I I found people. There's a class of people who find CQ much more readable because it's a lot less technical, more newsy about what amazing. people there are doing. There is not an, a column for new amateurs anywhere. But there isn't a column, and I remember when I was a novice, there was a column in Popular Electronics which had pictures of other cool yeah. kids, and some of them had worked like over 10 states, which was an amazing uh, feat yeah. back in those days. And there would be an occasional girl, and wow, that was in, in, incredible. Uh, <laughs> let's see, we have a few more comments. Let's go Jim first, and then. I think what we all talked about is that this whole thing is a process. It's not any one individual step. When you've got the clubs that will pick it up, that's great. If you've got a BD session that will pick it up, that's great. The subject that we were trying to discuss, though, so, and, and, and every one of those is run by an individual organization, and what they do or what they don't do is not something that we're going to have any kind of control over. What we're talking about is how can we most effectively immerse the new licensee into the world of ARRL. And obviously all the rest of these things have to happen too, but the suggestion that they be given a free, free membership I continue to believe is a very strong point. Your question about renewal is obviously an issue that has to be addressed too. Okay, we had a couple more comments. Uh, yes, when the gentleman here was talking about the get on the air class, that isn't a hit or miss thing. We do it every single month. And which and club are you with? We're in San Diego. Oh, uh, which group though? Um, after the Aries meeting. After the Aries meeting. So oh, Aries, San Diego Aries. Okay. We already have built-in elders that have attended the Aries meeting. They just slide on over and 
and we have people come. We had one dear gentleman who showed up for about six months, and then we said, um, you're now an Elmer. <laughs> <laughs> you obviously have nothing else to do on Saturday mornings. Uh, but it's worked out very well. But San Diego Aries has grown. Yes. yes. And, and being able to have people, they've just got their license and it's advertised by the BEs that this is available. My husband teaches the cram class. He lets them know that this is available after they get their license. And we have never had less than 10 people show up. And when we first started it, I thought, and it'll go three months and it'll die. We're going three years. Well, San Diego is successful. Los Angeles Aries is quite successful also. The, um, the, the size of their meetings is are one of the larger groups in the uh, uh, in, in section. We had a comment there. Yeah, I, I don't know how successful, uh, uh, anyone didn't hear it, there used to be a kids column and I don't know that it is successful or they have anyone who will do it now. John. Okay, I want to back up to what I was trying to ask a while ago. We give a 90 day access to anybody who wants to join you know, going to our website. It seems like there's some, I'm not an IT guy, but it seems like there's some mechanism there to, to, to do that. And what I'm saying is if we can, Either make it a 90 or six months or whatever, uh, full uh, elite membership with online where they can, you know, because the QC magazine is available for a member at uh, that website there. You know, it's a way to give you know, fulfillment without a lot of cost and like that. It looks like we got some mechanism there. We just need to expand that so so as they get uh, access to. Our website, are, I'm assuming they're getting access to QST Magazine during that tiny time we just on the website. If not, we just need to be able Add to that. that button. All right, let me ask the group um, two questions, and you can say yes to both of them. How many believe that it would be in the interest of the league to give all new hams, all 30,000 of them, a one year league membership, which would uh, include a magazine coming every month? Uh, no, a mailed magazine. And I'm going to ask it again um, about a digital magazine. So let's the mailed magazine is of the order of 13, and uh, the a digital magazine, um, almost the whole room. And um, was it would, should there be any other questions yeah, asked? A reduced fee, 20 bucks. How about the twenty dollar a year fee for a magazine? And we're Put in over half. So we have uh, almost not that many for a free total year. About half for half, uh, twenty dollar a year, and almost everyone for a free uh, digital. Uh, um, a membership. Okay, we're at five o'clock where we're supposed to end. I, there isn't any reason we can't go over. Is there anything else anyone would, would like to bring up or comment on? I'd like to bring up the uh, mobile DXCC uh, proposal. The mobile DXCC proposal has been approved. The, I've seen the certificates. If it hasn't been publicized, it's going to be publicized very shortly. I'd like to wonder is Uh, is it a good idea or a bad idea with respect to the driving laws of, and the, uh, let's see here, Virgil. Uh, well, that, that oh, that's not a separate topic. The answer is, because of what you just brought up, there are pluses and minuses. My hope is that the people doing mobile DXCC are going to stop their car or they're going to have um, wire uh, uh, hand-free mics or some combination of that and uh, they'll do it that way. There is, I mean, there aren't a, an awful lot of people doing mobile DXCC. I don't know we're going to change the uh, net accident rate across the country. 
was, but you did bring out an interesting point. Is there a, Mike. Is there a start date for it, like when they came out with CWs, or does it go back? I'm not certain. Okay, I'll look I, I don't know whether there was a start date. Um, Virgil. is I was indeed uh, censured and I suppose that is an action that's taken so that you will all be uh, concerned about my um, uh, activity and my reputation will be going down. I'm not 100% sure that's worked out the way uh, <laughs> uh, it was planned. Uh, I'm going to uh, take uh, one minute and unfortunately K6FG left but I'm going to do uh, exactly what I did at the Visalia uh, ARL forum at, at the Visalia DX convention last spring. And I'm going to say to you that the ARL has enacted a code of conduct for directors and vice directors which alters my uh, association with you and how I uh, in, interact with you. And I'm going to talk about three things. Number one, my primary responsibility now is to the corporation. It's not to the membership, it's not to amateur radio as a whole, it's not to the United States, it's to the corporation. Number two, I'm not allowed to tell you how I voted on an issue and why unless it's recorded in the minutes and as uh, uh, we can ask for uh, votes to be recorded and if you do that ahead of time, that's okay. If you somehow decide at the end, uh, you after the board meeting is over, that you'd like to discuss it, that was not uh, permitted. And number three, I was, uh, I'm obligated to support all decisions of the board of directors, which of course meant that I had to support being censured, uh, which I thought was somewhat interesting. Well, um, as it's turned out, at the last board meeting, um, of some of those uh, thousand uh, emails that went to the directors suggested that maybe the code of conduct wasn't something that the members thought was really a good thing and some of them thought that maybe the censuring wasn't really such a good thing and so what the league did is um, there was an uh, there was a proposal to eliminate the code of conduct and start all over um, that in the end, uh, they didn't eliminate it, but they made two changes to it. The first is they eliminated the part where I'm not allowed to tell you how I voted. So now I can tell you how I voted and why, and I've done that on uh, several of the things today. And number two, they have suspended the fact that I have to agree, uh, uh, support all decisions of the board of directors. Now I'm not sure what suspended means, whether they could come back and say, well, we unsuspend it for the uh, Yuma Ham Fest. I, I don't know, but anyhow, so I, right now I don't feel like I have to publicly go out and support uh, having been censured. Now, the first three things I did were exactly, uh, that I talked about here, were exactly what I did at the Visalia uh, Forum, and I turned it over to the audience for their comments. And the first person to comment uh, was here. He's left. He commented 
uh, somehow he didn't think that this was appropriate. When he sat down, the room burst out into applause. They didn't applaud what I did. They applauded what one of the members uh, had just talked about. And then another 10 or so members made uh, comments that were quite similar. So I was then accused of uh, uh, talking negatively about the code of conduct and, um, uh, and, and we conducted a one hour trial on the telephone, which actually the articles of association of the ARRL say anything like this is, a, is to be held in person, but that was ignored. Um, an interesting thing about the code of conduct is I'm going to read you one of the sentences that are, that's still um, applicable and it says, any complaint made under this policy, any and all proceedings of the Ethics and Elections Committee involved in investigating and resolving it, and any outcome of such proceedings other than a public reprimand, suspension, expulsion of other or other outcome that requires disclosure of the ARRL shall be considered board confidential unless the subject of the complaint requests disclosure of those proceedings. So um, nothing that's happened is, is um, confidential because they did uh, announce a, uh, uh, what they did. So I'm expecting within the next month or so to put out all the uh, emails that had anything to do with this. And you can see who the person who made the complaint was, uh, how he was solicited, how he didn't make the complaint until uh, uh, many months after the uh, incident took place. And the fact that there were five people who um, sent uh, uh, correspondence to the board saying, no, that what, what happened was this. Uh, I explained what the three features of the, the uh, code of conduct were, and it was the members that spoke against it, not me. But, uh, and then since then, we've had maybe 20 or 25 other people who were in the audience who agreed with that. So um, right now, the issue is the board is saying, we, one guy is telling the truth, and 20 or 25 people got it wrong. Um, that's up to you to decide which side you'd like to believe. Um, so that's kind of where we stand now. Um, has this, as I said, I, I'm not sure that the results that came out were what the people who uh, instigated it had uh, in mind. Um, and uh, what, do you, what else would you like anyway, to say? With, with that being the truth, I think the, the board owes, owes us, the membership, the, the decency to then reverse your Right? Well, there may be 500 or so emails that I've gotten that say the same thing, but yeah. they didn't have to con happen to convince uh, enough of the board. Actually, there was no motion made to even uh, uh, talk about it, so um, that's where that stands. So, so I guess my concern on that same note is, is uh, I want you to be my director, and I don't want them to you know, do what they did with some of the other gentlemen and, and not allow you to run when your term comes up. That's, that's where my concern is, right? Exactly. I exactly. A lot of well, I, I thank you uh, both for saying that. I received uh, a reasonable support. I appear there's more than one or two of you that feel the same way. Uh, thank you all. Um, I'm reasonably optimistic uh, that that when I run again, uh, if I do, it's still, what, a year and a half away, um, and I still have two, two uh, more than two years left, so um, I, I think things will work out. And this has been an interesting time. Um, as I said before, we now have these essentially political parties. A lot of you now are aware of it. Other people have been made aware of it. Let's see if we can uh, uh, take action so that, in the end, amateur radio and the ARRL uh, benefit from uh, what we're all doing. Isn't the question here the Election and Ethics Committee, though? Yeah. It, they collect, it's the Ethics and Elections Committee, which is a subset of the political party that's in power and a, a group of people who feel that they should make decisions and not necessarily even hear uh, the other side of stories, but that's, um, th yes, that's... Uh, the point is we can't 
stop making noise. Right. Well, uh, uh, then we have. There's a great Facebook group. Um, so, uh, as uh, Mike just pointed out, there is uh, the My ARL Voice uh, has a Facebook group with people, many people commenting and saying similar things. Any more comments on that issue? I thank you all for attending, and uh, I'll see some of you again in uh, Visalia. Okay, that was uh, Dick Norton. N6AA. He covered a lot of topics. Uh, there was a lot of uh, information from the audience. Uh, I wonder if you out there in the listenerhood have had problems with uh, your digital QST uh, magazine edition. Um, I, I've had some challenges over the year. I think that they had tried to improve it. I'm not sure if it's any better or not. Uh, I know there were a lot of gentlemen that stuck around after the meeting and uh, couldn't get it to work on some phones and could get it to work on others. Uh, a lot of other good um, uh, good stuff that he covered there. Uh, you know, at the end, if you made it all the way to the end, and I hope you did, uh, there was some stuff about his censure and uh, what he thought or hoped might um, happen going forward. Uh, we talked about um, how to engage new members, and I think that's an important thing. It actually kind of spurred me to think about um, maybe uh, another show or maybe even a series of short videos on... Um, how to get your new member if you're a VE, how to, how to get them engaged and keep them around, or, or maybe another video for, um, to show that new member uh, after they took their license and maybe they're waiting for the, uh, for the results of their test to say, you know, what are those 10 or 12 things to do now that they have their amateur radio license? Lots of other topics as well. Uh, so this is the first of the two forums that I recorded. I'll work on um, editing and putting together that other forum later this week. Um, and there was also a little bit of video I had from a balloon launch, a high altitude balloon launch that they did there at the Yuma Ham Fest. And um, so look forward to that, uh, to seeing that soon. Um, if you like what we're doing or you like what I'm doing and uh, you want to keep supporting me and, and making this happen, uh, please visit hamradionow.tv and uh, look for Arvin and click and feed the pig. Uh, as Gary said, it's uh, free to watch, but it's not free to make. Uh, we'd appreciate your support if you appreciate what we're doing. Anyhow, um, I think that's it for now. I will say 7-3. This is David Goldenberg, W0DHG, over and out.